Okay. So Nigeria. The challenge for sexual transmissible diseases is that you have to understand the anatomy of reproductive tract and also have a little bit of information on physiology. It would be easier for you to pick up the signs and symptoms and also pick up the trend because once we start teaching you STDs, we are going to uh, give you a lot of data because that's something that you may want to know. So once there's a workshop as well, when we go to the workshop, we will compare all the bacterial, viral, parasitic STDs at one time. But these lectures are designed in a way, and um, I've taken a standard lecture from the workshop of STD. So these are like standardized lectures and I've, what I've tried to do is that I've tried to incorporate some of the figures from the book. The thing that you have to understand when we talk of sexual transmissible diseases is that it is an epidemic. It's an epidemic and unfortunately underappreciated and third thing is largely hidden from public discourse. That's why if you see reports for this one is considered as a hidden epidemic. We have to educate our healthcare professionals. We have to educate uh, quite a few groups in the people. So I'll just start historically to give you an update with the military because that's where Unfortunately, most of the stress started from. I'm going to give you some of the uh, pictures that come from National Science Library where they keep the records of the origination of some of the bacteria or the problem. When they thought they started paying attention that STD is a problem. So I'll just play one of the posters that was posted in World War I for the soldiers. So this is basically coming from uh, the National Library of Medicine and uh, I mean, you can well imagine for STDs initially they found out that all the soldiers out there in diff different deputed different parts of the world they have to be educated because they were far from their homes and they were in the kind of desperation and they were looking for all opportunities that they may get. <laughs> right, and they would go for anything. So they wanted to make sure that if you get a VD, then you're not basically loyal to the country and loyal to so and so. And the problem at that time, of course, was that we didn't have any treatment for venereal diseases or STDs. And at the same time, if you look at historically, that uh, these are the Posters from World War II, the American soldiers and sailors were counseled. So they were basically counseled because there was nothing there. There was no antibiotic. And you can imagine to such an extent that they were giving over here uh, mercury. So you can see from here. And then after a while, when they used to do all this advertisement, and all of a sudden penicillin comes. So may have eased the burden on quite a few soldiers though. But you can see historically uh, there are groups of people, there are, uh, especially in this country, especially we'll give you some uh, statistics on the uh, incidence of sex in high school students, both male and female. So you see CDC is keeping a record for that. So let me start with a prototype case. So give you an idea especially for the immune response. And this is an impact case. It's from your book. I want you to read it. 
So you can see a typical case, 17 year old girl, she gets admitted, she has a history of four day fever, chills and malaise, sore throat, skin rash and polyarthralgia. Just imagine if you happen to be there, you will take this very lightly. But if those of you who understand uh, the nature of immune response that you normally get to some of the bacteria, they will try to put these two, two things together and would suggest that what is it that she is getting polyarthralgia for. All her joints are inflamed and painful on top of a typical flu-like symptoms. And when they take history, uh, she is sexually active and she has a five-week history of profuse yellowish vaginal discharge. So vaginal discharge again remains as one of the common things that you get especially if you have to see STD in females. Unfortunately it was untreated, that happens many a time. And then again uh, what they saw was that she had maculopapular skin lesion. As I said yesterday skin lesions have to be taken very seriously and you shouldn't give an opinion for that and what they saw was that they were present on her forearm, thigh and ankle and as I said that this kind of a rash along with her joint problem, almost all her joints were acutely inflamed and that would suggest to you a very strong immune response if you remember type 2, type 3 hypersensitivity reactions where you have an antigen antibody complexes and they've been deposited especially in different areas like joints. She has an elevated leukocyte count, of course, because her cells are fighting that bacteria. When they do culture, and this is something that you need to know, when they go for blood specimen, skin lesion, they don't find any bacteria. So they would have sent her home sterile, nothing to worry about. But she, since she is young and she is sexually active, she has vaginal discharge, they would rather go for uh, culture of cervix and there they find Neisseria gonorrhea. So that's a typical case where you have a disseminated polyarthralgia, a disseminated skin rash and then uh, the point over here in this case is that if you get a negative blood culture should not fool you and you shouldn't send the patient back home, want to take very careful uh, history and uh, before you start treatment. So you can see from here uh, different type of rashes. This is cervix, inflamed cervix, strawberry spots. All these different aspects of clinically will suggest to you that there is a nasty bacteria and this bacteria has a liking for skin and mucous membrane and uh, historically a generalized skin rash with macular papular and I would suggest to you, those of you who don't know what a macule or papule is, to go over the skin lecture that I had in physiology. So you'd have a little bit of an idea what are the basic lesions in the skin. Now, we want to give credit to this young German physician and bacteriologist, uh, Albert Neisser, who in 1879 discovered not only gonorrhea, but he also discovered mycobacterium leprae and and many other bacteria. So that's where the Neisseria word is coming from and it's like 1879, not very far from here. If you look at the family per se, the genus Neisseria, so you can see from here there are 10 species found in human but two are most important that I'm going to discuss today. One causes gonorrhea, of course, the name suggests that, Neisseria gonorrhea and Neisseria meningitidis. So that of course means it's going to cause meningitis. So these are important and they are strictly human pathogens. This means they will only cause disease in human and not in any other species. The other important thing you have to keep in mind is that other than these two, a very common question asked, other than these two, you may pick up Neisseria from as a normal compensator for vaginal flora or oral flora or any other flora or genital flora in this case, but uh, if you are able to culture gonorrhea and Neisseria, they are strict pathogens. They should not be there unless there's a good reason for them to be there, like an STD. Okay? And uh, 
most of the diseases that we normally see uh, other than these two may have a limited, for example, any other Neisseria family member, if they do cause a disease, remember one of the questions in immunology was that uh, if you are immunodeficient, so those bacteria which are pathogenic, they will cause disease anyway, it doesn't really matter. But non-pathogenic, those diseases which should normally be taken care of by your immune system should not be the one causing disease to tell you that you have a normal immune system. So our immune system is good enough to fight unless you are compromised. Compromise could be AIDS, compromise could be malnourished, compromise is that you have a chronic illness and you're fighting many other things. Biology virus and disease is a gram negative and gram negative as you know again is a dangerous word in bacteriology. The moment we say gram negative start thinking of all those nasty things that this bacteria can do. Diplococci, right, and there were quite a few other bacteria that I told you are diplococci, and be prepared for a question that what, which of the following are bacteria are diplococci. So there are, some of them are gram positive as well, okay? They have fastidious, fastidious growth requirements suggesting difficult to grow. You really are, that's good for us, because if it's easy, then they can grow at any place. This is fastidious, so they will take time. But they tend to grow in a more or less normal temperature that we have, humid atmosphere. They have their oxidase and catalase positive. That would suggest to you what kind of tissue injury they would cause. And then the acid produced from glucose oxidatively. So this is how they metabolize. This is how we, this is the basis of the test. And there goes the problem now. And remember, as a rule, I said, the more antigens you have, more virulence factor you have, the more difficult for us, number one, to make vaccine, number one, number two, to even treat these patients. Multiple antigen, they have pili proteins, porous proteins, and you can see they have pretty much everything that they need to hang on to your, to latch on to your cells, invade your cell, cause problem to your cell, even to such an extent that they also come up with immunoglobulin protease. So remember your mucosa, vaginal epithelium or urethral epithelium or oral epithelium is covered with IgA, that's protective. This, this bacteria has a protease. So it will come up first and chew up your antibody. So this would suggest that that's a virulence factor. Then again, beta lactamase. So if you wanna give a penicillin, so of course it has a lactase, lactam ring this bacteria will secrete a factor a enzyme which chew that up. Gram staining, typical, you can see from here, uh, Neisseria diplococci, they tend to occur in pairs. And then again, because this is a probably a urethral or vaginal swab, so you see other cells of mucosal epithelium as well. Another slide, gram staining over here, diplococci. And uh, if you want to look at some of the uh, electron micrographs, so you can see a typical diplococci and another one, diplococci. And finally, you can see from here, uh, again, this is a urethral exudate because many times, as in the case of that 17-year-old young girl, uh, we did urine, we did uh, vaginal swab, and we did blood cultures, they were all negative. We had to do a cervical swab to look for Nicaea gonorrhea to find out if she was really suffering from that. But you can see over here, these are some of the epithelial cells, but a bunch of uh, bacteria sitting over there. So for those of you who did gram staining, they know you have to find out where the bacteria are in the low power and high power. Okay, <clears throat> now, as we discussed earlier, they are gram-negative, diplococci. Uh, this is a good news for us, that they are not mortal. So this means they cannot move much because they don't have that kind of flagella, that kind of a tail, like a flipper at the back, it will push them up. They don't form endospores as compared to Clostridia. All species are oxidative positive. They produce catalase. 
And then again, these are two important uh, biochemical tests that you want to differentiate N gonorrhea from N meningitis because uh, they both are positive for glucose and one of them is negative for maltose. So these are like a, the pattern of carbohydrate utilization because remember, once we pick up Neisseria, we don't know which one of the Neisseria we are fighting for. So we have to do this biochemical test to figure that out. Uh, pathogenesis and immunity, again, remember the rule is that bacteria need to attach to this mucosal cell. It has to penetrate the mucosal cell. It has to secrete all those toxins which are there and then establish infection. And I'm going to give you a, an important um, definition as well. When we say sexual transmissible diseases, right, as compared to sexual transmissible infections, so the two, two terms that we normally use. A person may be infected with any of the organism that may cause disease, but we will categorize that as STIs. So you may be infected or it may not show the disease as yet because once we uh, study them in detail you will see that you could be asymptomatic. That's where the problem comes. Everything's okay. You saw this young girl, she has, she's having yellowish vaginal discharge untreated for five weeks. So people kind of take things lightly and then the problems come. These are the attachment proteins. So you can see three attachment proteins and they are both required. And then that will answer you if you want to stop the bacteria being attached to epithelium, you want to do something for these proteins. The uh, gonococcal lipooligosaccharide, it's not a lipopolysaccharide, LPS, it's a lipooligosaccharide, and it is going to be a pro inflammatory and going to release quite a few pro inflammatory cytokines like TNF alpha. So, tumor necrosis factor is one of the major thing that you will normally see. A good uh, table from your book and you can see it is tying down virulence factors and what are the biological effect it has. So you can see as I said yesterday or day before yesterday uh, the more virulence factors they are the more uh, pathogenic or more disease causing capability that bacteria will possess. At the same time, also, uh, we have more options to treat. So we can go after each one of them and develop some new drugs. So that's, again, an R&D kind of thing. So you can see from here, some of the proteins are there which have the special attachment. For example, pilin. It's like a pili, those hairy thing. This basically has an attachment to non-ciliated cells because... Ciliated cells are those cells that have those hair-like pattern that we have in uh, respiratory mucosa. But if they don't have that hair-like projections, so they cannot easily latch onto the bacteria. So what it happens is that these proteins will help them, especially for epithelium of vagina, fallopian tube, and buccal cavity, because these don't have those fimbri. It's non-ciliated epithelium. So they come up with their own cilia, like a latch onto those particular epithelia and again interferes with neutral killing. And then again, PAR protein is the one that will promote intracellular survival and then again prevent phagolysosome fusion in neutrophil. Remember one of the questions I asked especially is that let's say neutrophils can phagocytose, right? But after phagocytosis, cytosis, phagosome has to fuse with lysosome. So let's say even that happened, but now lysosome has to release antioxidants uh, to Oxidant, not antioxidant, oxidants to kill that bacteria. So they, can't, they can all be defective. Not only defective, but bacteria can also resist being phagocytose number one. Bacteria can come up with a mechanism that it will not let lysosome phagosome fusion occur. And that because of this thing, protein, uh, poor protein, that it will prevent phagolysome fusion neutrophils. So neutrophils would not be good enough to take care of that. Then again, uh, other proteins over here, they are important and some of them are considered uh, as a mean of immune response. So these proteins are good targets for antibodies to be developed. So that could be used later for tests. And then again, uh, this particular bacteria 
has a liking for iron. So that's another important thing. So this means when this is growing in you, you will deplete of your iron. And sometimes, you know, iron is required as normal production of hemoglobin, and hemoglobin is required for oxygen transport. So you can see that it comes with transferrin binding proteins, lactoferrin binding proteins, and hemoglobin binding proteins. So these are three important binding protein because this bacteria wants to acquire iron for its own division and metabolism. And it is coming with a whole package of that. And then you can see from here, iron, iron, iron. So this would also suggest to you that sometimes we have to supplement people who have an STD with gonorrhea because they will have lack of iron, so they may have some respiratory problems as well. Uh, LOS, lipooligosaccharide, is, uh, has an endotoxin kind of activity. It's not LPS, which is the most potent stimulatory immune system. Then I said earlier, it has an IgA protease, we talked about that, where uh, this bacteria will release that, and chew up IgA, no protection, and invade mucosa. And then finally, it is going to hydrolyze the beta lactam, bring in penicillin, so it can make penicillin resistant. So there are at least like five, six questions you can see right with tie up with the virulence factor, with the effect they have. And they all become, this is what pathogenesis means. One of the objectives for every microbe is I want you to know how would that bacteria cause disease. This is how it causes disease, bacterial pathogenesis right from the attachment, invasion, release of the toxin, and the after effects of the toxin, and how are we going to deal with that. Now, as I said earlier, for all those bacteria, viruses, and fungi, and parasites that call STD, I'm going to give you enormous data. Well, some of things I would want you to remember, and some of things is just for your information. So this is a summary slide for epidemiology for Neisseria, so you can see uh, only humans are natural host. It could be asymptomatic. That was the problem is. So women who have STD, they are asymptomatic and they would not get treated. They would not get attention before it causes problems. Transmission is sexual contact. That's why it's called STD. And then again, you can see, I'm going to give you the fresh. I just uploaded this morning from CDC, the data that CDC released of the incidence and prevalence of uh, STD like gonorrhea. But upshot is that this is very common in blacks, especially age group 15 to 24, especially uh, people towards uh, southeast of United States because East States maintains a record and very common in those people who have multiple sexual encounters. And then again, uh, dissemination of disease. These are like some of the key points, but I'm going to take you through them in detail. And the rest of it, of course, I would suggest to you that you can read it on your own. Now, the question you may ask, uh, let me go through that. I would want you to read it on your own. I'll just show you the graphs and then you can uh, correlate this graph with this epidemiology survey data. Okay. All right. Now, this is what uh, is there in terms of the real story of STD. And this is again for USA. What they think is, uh, it is a tip of iceberg. Also remember that they would think that how many of people would really go and seek attention if they have an STD. It's underreported, undertreated. Right? People will keep on waiting and waiting and waiting till they get something that is painful. So pain brings people to STD clinic. Before that, they would do all these homemade remedies, you know, all those their friends say and their whosoever says, so they keep on applying and using till they get pain. I'm gonna go through that and tell you exactly what the problem is. So uh, this will just give you a rough idea because it's an old data, but you can see these are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight important STDs that we have in this country. And within eight, the ratio of incidents keep on changing. But as of now, I'm going to give you the fresh data, chlamydia remains number one STD in this country. Number two is gonorrhea, syphilis, trichomoniasis, herpes simplex virus, herpes papilloma virus, hepatitis B and HIV. But you can see uh, 
incidence and the prevalence is pretty much high by all standards. And then again, I'm going to give you precise data uh, because CDC has an interest and you should have an interest and all of us should have an interest because we're going to come across this group of people. Now, 2011, that's the latest one I could upload this morning. So they have a record from 1941 till 2011. And you can see up and down surges and this is like 100,000 population. So it, it's like 500, maybe like 450 per 100,000 population, right? And you can see there was a peak over here in 70s and 90s. Still by all standards, even today, we are looking at 100 per 100,000 population, which I know you know stats more than me, so it's pretty significant. Okay. And again, if you look at the rates by states, that's why the southeastern states have a very high incidence as this state, but again, other than the population, because California does have a high population, but these other uh, states don't have much population, but they, they've been kind of adjusted to the population, but still very, very high incidence rate in southeast uh, states. If you want to determine as compared to uh, rates by sex, so you can see uh, 91 was the peak where uh, men had more gonorrhea as compared to uh, women, but it's no other way around. It has flipped back, and now we have more women having STD by gonorrhea as compared to men. If you look at by race and ethnicity, so you can see from here, we we'll start from the bottom, the uh, Pacific Islanders, whites, Hispanics, Asian, and no comparison with the black population is totally out of control. If you look at the uh, men and women and in terms of age, so you can see from here, younger people for some reason, 15 to 24 have a highest incidence, whether it be male or female. So both of them have a very high incidence over here. And as we grow older, probably people don't wanna go to that kind of promiscuity, pretty much it. Now, why do people come in STD clinic? Number one, they don't, right? Most, well, you can argue that people don't have insurance. You can do whatever you want to do. But most of the time, people would come and they, STD people will call it as, this brings them to STD. Of course, they're not dripping urine. They are dripping pus. They are dripping blood. So the moment a person walks into the clinic and he says, I've got drips, he's talking about pus, he's talking about blood. And this is the commonest causes of drips. Gonorrhea remains number one. You may have non-gonococcal urethritis, chlamydia, and so on and so forth. But um, let's talk of Neisseria gonorrhea in terms of the diseases and what it causes. So you can see from here, uh, you can have a full-blown gonorrhea that I just mentioned. Typical presentation is you have a pus coming from urethra, prostate, anus, right? And of course, as a, as a vaginal discharge. And then again, uh, if it stays for a longer period, most of the time people kind of wait and will hope that it disappears. If it doesn't, then they will come back. The number two is that it may also cause disseminated infection. That's what you saw in that young girl impact case. Because now she's not having a vaginal yellowish color, vaginal discharge, but she has all her joints inflamed, right? And that's a serious problem. Then she also has that pustular. Pustular means those bumps having clear fluid or non-clear fluid. So if you see a skin and you see the pimples, but they are filled with something we call pustular. That's what the infectivity is. That's what the, the infection can be passed on. And then again, if that happens in, as in, in, in birth canal or vagina, and if they happen to give birth to neonate, neonate especially, eyes will be infected. A very common condition we call ophthalmia, ophthalmia neonatorum. So that's the major uh, neonatal problem. And many times, actually, uh, expectant mothers are the one that they basically test them for STDs 
because they are more worried about the kids being born to them and the uh, the route of the delivery they're gonna go and okay now I just said drips but by the end of the day uh, if you look at pathology you will see clinically this is coming from urethritis in male so inflammation of urethra and that's why they start getting uh, dysuria, I mean painful micturition, painful urination, or they may see urethral discharge. But the good news for men is that 95% they're symptomatic, and so they will see that happening. If you compare that with women, it's the other way around. So they are asymptomatic, so they will carry it, pass it on to their partners, and would not know and would not seek treatment. And then again, it may have complications. Uh, for female, we say urogenital. The reason is because of the proximity of urethra with vagina and then up into cervix. So whatever happens in that area spreads out and then these bacteria move up to the upper part of vagina into anterior and posterior fornix and up into the uh, head of the cervix, into the cervix and then even go into, uh, into uterus. So you can see from here, they have... Uh, endocervical canal as a primary site. Uh, most of the time it colonizes urethra. They have a incubation period. Incubation period is that person may have a sexual encounter and things don't develop right away. So there is a time where bacteria has to wait, build up enough number, start releasing those pathogenic factor and then go from there. And then again, many a time they present, again I said asymptomatic, it may it is a problem actually. When you have a disease, you don't have a symptom, what can you do? So you would not seek treatment. It's so natural, but that's a bigger problem in gonorrhea because uh, they will keep on sitting on their vaginal discharge for a long time and then they may have dysuria, urination, and then local inflammatory response. And then again, they will have complications. Now, the other thing I'm gonna tell, as I said, that today is the first lecture for STB and I just want you to emphasize some of the important things. So if blood or pus comes from male urethra or female urethra, the chances are that it's urethritis by gonococcal. But again, as a differential diagnosis, it could be non-gonococcal urethritis as well. That's number one. Number two is that uh, many a times when people will come to you in STD clinic or in a general clinic, they would have already taken tons of antibiotics, they would have treated themselves, they would have passed it on to the people. So this is another important thing. That's why when we see cases for STDs, uh, we have to take their sexual history very carefully because uh, we the target uh, of the treatment is not the patient themselves, but their sexual partners as well. That's going to be another challenge. But firstly, they will not disclose, let alone they're going to bring them up and they need to be treated as well. So that again is a big challenge. But of course, I remember some of the students told me in previous classes that some of them worked in STD clinic. This is a big job. It's very difficult to make people kind of give you a good, uh, good history in terms of their sexual partner. Gonorrhea, as I said, pus. This is like CDC educative slides uh, coming from urethra. You can see inflammation in, in around the meatus. It's very painful. That probably brought this person to, uh, to, the, to the clinic. Now, in this case, what you see, you see pus and inflammation in the external urethra. As compared to the other one I'm going to show you, where you do not. So that basically is non-gonococcal urethritis. So just like clinical things that you may see, you don't have to diagnose it. Physicians do it. But non-gonococcal urethritis would suggest to you that it is not as bad. And most of the time it's coming from trachomatis and some other things that we will discuss over, over time. <coughs> also keep in mind that many times we want to uh, correlate a bacteria with the patient's condition and that may not happen. Number one, also keep in mind basic rule of microbiology, we cannot possibly culture all microbes. There will still be some microbes, they are out there and we, are, we don't know their name. We don't know what they are. We have no means of finding it out. That's why you see over here, 
unknown. 50% of cases, unknown. You would, you would not even know what's going on. These cases are mild dysuria and mucoid discharge. The only problem with these cases is when men have that kind of, uh, uh, kind of discharge, they will mistake it as semen. So that's been another problem that because it resembles semen, so they will tell you what you need to do is the semen should not have uh, too many, well, not too many, not at all, any neutrophils because neutrophils will suggest inflammation, neutrophils suggest in infection. So you really have to make sure that you do a typical uh, test on them and find out what is going on. So as, can, as I said earlier, it could be confused with semen, uh, white, yellowish, or green discharge, purulent discharge in men with urethritis. The only uh, important thing is that they will have enormous amount of pain. So pain in urethra in male is very severe. So it is such a thing. And then again, there are a lot of after effects for that. It's one of the worst pains that men can ever have. So you can see other skin lesions. Uh, cl clinically, uh, classic lesion is a necrotic, grayish lesion. I mean, I'm just reading it. If you were to show me up and ask me what it is, I have no ways of finding out. It's very difficult to do it just on the base of the lesion. But what you can do is, uh, you just have to ask the person, how long has it been for? Right, it's not acute. If it's a chronic, if it's coming with many other symptoms, if there's a sexual history, so and so forth, there you go. So their chances are. Uh, gonococcal ophthalmia neonaterum, you can see babies born uh, with mothers having vaginal uh, gonorrhea. Normally it should not occur because they would do a test and if a mother does have a gonorrhea and her birth canal is infected, they would rather deliver her through abdomen. Severe form of a skin lesion uh, where uh, this particular bacteria goes to meninges. Remember, it can, Neisseria, especially the second one, has a liking for meninges. So these Neisseria family, one likes to hang on to urethral and vaginal epithelium. The other wants to latch on to the membrane. And there's a good reason because they have a, a typical... Uh, a, a pili to get attached to it. This property is called tropism. Again, uh, CDC does maintain a record of very unfortunate things that may happen, especially in incest, where you, we see young girls or any, any, anybody else, especially in children who become victim of incest, and then again they would culture gonorrhea from their, uh, this girl's vagina. How do you diagnose? Of course, you can do a gram staining, but the most important thing is culture. And recently, we have come up with nucleic acid amplification assays, and there are tons of them available. I'm going to talk about that today, and they are out there as a very good source of determining where exactly the bacteria is coming from. Now, once this bacteria get into your system, so you can see the spectrum of disease because it comes with a lot of virulent factors, right? So you can say it starts with pharyngitis, it comes to skin, it can go basically uh, even disseminated into the blood and different parts of the body. The most important thing other than, of course, is an STD, the genitalia is affected, but you can see that other than that, the whole immune response will take it to the joints. So you can see, that's why I had the caption on that case of 17-year-old girl at disseminated gonorrhea with polyarthralgia. So it is not one joint that's inflamed and painful. All heart joints are inflamed and painful. So how do you treat it? Uh, Ceftraxone is basically the drug of choice, but you can also give uh, doxycycline as, as erythromycin. And then again, uh, if it's not, especially if it's complicated for chlamydia. The other rule for STD is, once you see a patient, because most of the time, STD is not, is a behavioral problem. So they, they need a psychotherapy as, because as I said, it's like soldiers. You have to understand where is it coming from, right? So this is a desperation. There is a habit forming thing. There's an addiction over there. There are predators. 
There's something coming up from there, that side. So what you need to do is that you have, most of the time, they would not have an STD because of one bacteria. They will have more than one STD. So they will have gonorrhea, they will have chlamydia, they will have HIV, there are tons of them because their behavior or whatever they were doing, their promiscuity, that will kind of lead them into that. So you have to make sure that you shouldn't become happy just by picking up one bacteria and say, there you go, I got it. No, you have to look for some other, like chlamydia. For neonates, you have to use 1% silver nitrate. How do you prevent? Of course, as you can see, patient education. And then again, uh, other effective measures. But as I said earlier, very, very aggressive follow-up. Looks very simple. It's not that simple uh, of their sexual partners. Firstly, they would not admit how many partners do they have. And, and then again, uh, the numbers they give men, men used to exaggerate and women used to under exaggerate. So that's pretty much difficult uh, task that we have in terms of uh, uh, treatment, right? And then again, uh, vaccines are not available. I gave you a good reason because there are a lot of virulence factor, okay? So let's gear uh, to Neisseria meningitis. And then again, uh, first slide as usual about biology, virulence and disease, the gram negative diplococci, fastidious growth, good. Pretty much the same till here, they have common things. And then outer surface antigens has a polysaccharide capsule, lipo oligopoly, oligosaccharide. And a basic understanding is any bacteria that has a capsule, so capsule acts as antiphagocytic. Right. So this nasty bacteria, you should not leave it to your neutrophils to take over and protect you because even antibodies cannot coat it and complements cannot tag it for neutrophils to absorb. As I said earlier, uh, for some good reason, uh, especially this particular Neisseria has a liking, a receptor to go and attach to meninges of the brain. And they also have affinity for nasopharynx. So they will stay in the nasopharynx and then move from there. This bacteria can survive intracellularly in the absence of humoral immun immunity. So this means is that, uh, remember, what it is implies is, the basic immunology understanding, any bacteria that goes into the cell is hidden from antibodies because antibodies would not go and poke into the cell. Now that is left on your MSC, that is left on your T cell. So T cell have to do that job to locate and find out but again, they have their own limitations. So that's where it's coming from, okay? And uh, LOS, which is like a type of an endotoxin that pretty much is responsible for most of the response that you normally see. If you look at the gram staining, and again, you can see diplococci, typical diplococci, and again, it could be a, a CSF specimen where you see other cells as well. If you look at the diseases, again, Meningitis, very common, inflammation of meninges, and no matter what microbe produces meningitis, the symptoms are the same. There's a neck stiffness, right? And then again, there is a fever, a very high mortality rate. Remember when we talk of Streptococcus pneumoniae, I told you uh, meningococcus. I said that's why you need to have a vaccine for because it has a very high incidence, it's mandatory. Meningococcemia, so th what it means is that it can be a disseminated infection where you have a thrombosis of small blood vessel and multi-organ involvement. So what normally happens is that what you saw in one of these skin lesion, there was a widely spread thing with petechial hemorrhages. So you see small little kind of blood dripped outside the skin. So that's where there are small hemorrhages and the bacteria is teeming in the blood. So it ruptures the small vessel, oozes out, and gives you a picture of a, 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 a lesion we call petechiae or petechial skin hemorrhages. Again, it can cause pneumonia as well, but usually in milder, milder form. If you look for epidemiology, again, you can see uh, humans are the only natural host. It can be spread from person to person. But this one has a respiratory spread as compared to the sexual spread that we had for gonorrhea. Very high incidence of a disease in children younger than five years, especially 
if they happen to be uh, institutionalized people or uh, well in dormitories or hostels or in daycare, things of that nature. And then again, uh, also remember late complement deficiency that was for both gonorrhea as well and this one as well because the reason is since they have a capsule, you need complement to coat them before they would uh, allow it to be phagocytosed. Then we look for the zero groups, and you can see they have BCY zero groups, and some of them have more incident, higher incidence in developed countries as to underdeveloped countries because they want to make sure they regulate that. Disease does occur worldwide, and mostly it's in dry and cold weather. How do you diagnose it? Again, pretty much the same standard diagnosis. You have to do a gram staining of CSF, but you can basically uh, also should go for culture because culture is definitive. You cannot say on the basis of gram staining because I told you there's some of the gram positive, they appear at diplococci. And then again, uh, the test to detect antigens, uh, it says insensitive and non-specific, meaning that those antigens that you pick up may not belong to this bacteria alone. So that may have a shared kind of a homology with some other bacteria. Even you pick it up would not make much of a difference. Finally, if you look at the uh, treatment prevention and control, basic immunology, you know that uh, breastfed infants will get the IgG from their mothers and that will protect them uh, as a passive immunity, especially for this Neisseria meningitidis for the first six months. If they do get infected, of course, uh, you start with penicillin, it's a drug of choice. And then again, uh, those people who come in contact with this or with the diseased person, you want to do a chemo prophylaxis. And these are some of the uh, drugs. Very common question asked that what are the name of the drugs that you can use for uh, chemo for pro prophylaxis for protecting yourself from Neisseria meningitis? And this is rifampin, which is an anti TB drug, and ciprofloxacin and citraxone. So these are some important things. You can also do immunoprophylaxis, like uh, chemoprophylaxis where you give a drug. So you can also do a chemoprophylaxis, especially uh, for those people who are working with this bacteria, uh, bacteria or who come in contact with that for some special reason. But again, uh, that kind of a vaccination could be used as an adjunct to that, just to boost up your general immune system. But so far, no effective vaccine is available, especially for the group B. So you can see from here, some of the classical bacteria that we teach you as an STD, and they have a presentation that you saw, especially for the drips for this particular case. And then upshot, I told you, especially in women, because they, they remain asymptomatic. And if they have more than one sexual partner, then they're gonna pass it to all those people and so on and so forth. And then uh, they themselves will start having different complications because the bacteria is dividing in their endocervical region and then would not have any symptom as compared to men. But that pretty much is the basis, I would consider as a base lecture as we move along to some of the other STD causing bacteria. And I'll also discuss uh, some of the uh, viruses in future that will help you understand some of the major concepts and major problems and, uh, and, the, and the major uh, challenges that we have in treating a patient who happen to have an STD, okay?